Event Horizon, the novelization of the film by Stephen E. MacDonald. Chapter 2 The traverse through Daylight Station could not have been quick enough for Weir. He doubted that it was quick enough for Admiral Hollis either. Hollis was not used to waiting for anything he wanted. The tube walls blurred by outside the station transport, but Weir, strap hanging in an empty car, paid them no attention preferring to spend his time rooting around in the recesses of his mind. He had hoped before, but this time it was certainty, cold and clear knowledge, transmitted to him in the form of a dream. The mechanism was unfamiliar, something he might have rejected without thinking twice before he began to explore ideas that delved into ways of rejecting or reconfiguring the laws of space-time. He had found a way down the rabbit hole into Wonderland, and he had been encouraged relentlessly with money, material, and facilities until everything had gone horribly wrong. Even so, they could not take the truth from him. He had found the rabbit hole, and he had shown the way. The transport disgorged him at his destination in the USAC command section. People flowed around him, intent on their own business, paying him no heed. No bosom's whistle meaning boffin on the bridge, just the odd dismissive look here and there and otherwise blind ignorance. He doubted that many of those in the command area knew who he was. He glanced down at his security badge once more, making certain it was properly in place. All he needed was some overzealous security thug taking a dislike to him. He knew his way around in command had for years. He glanced up at the wall displays, barely absorbing the images, taking note of the date and time. August 23, 2046. Seven years since. There was a cold feeling deep in his gut, as though mercury had pulled there. He walked slowly into the main reception area. He started to introduce himself, but the unsmiling man at the desk ignored him and stabbed a finger at the vid terminal near his right hand. Weir stood uncertainly in the center of the USAC seal that had, in a flagrant waste of taxpayers' money, been printed into the synthetic fiber carpet. Symbols and seals and codes by which men lived. So many things to despise. So little time to do anything but sell your soul for a shot at the main chance. The military mindset would not allow a good man to sink completely. But there was always one procedure too many to go through when it came to sorting out the mess. Weir watched the double doors to Hollis's office, trying not to shuffle his feet while he waited. After a few moments, one of the doors opened and Lyle emerged, walking quickly over to Weir. Lyle was still wearing her diplomatic face, still covering something. Weir favored her with an aggravated expression, hoping to give Lyle the impression he was as clueless as Lyle would like. No more than nods were exchanged before they went into Hollis's office. At this rate, Weir thought, we're going to have a conference in sign language and grunts. Hollis's office was still impressive, Weir noted. A video wall, currently blank, took up one side. Other monitors around the room played views of Earth from several different black sats. Hollis's desk was a dark monolith sitting to the back of the room an object even more imposing than the ominous video wall. There was a scattering of equipment on the top, arranged around an impressive black desk lamp that shone with halogen fury. The lights in the office were dimmed down so that Hollis's lair occupied the most visible spot. Behind the desk in the pool of light cast by his desk lamp sat Admiral John Hollis, looking like a bear considering mayhem. Weir had learned to trust Hollis over time, despite the gruff manner the Admiral cultivated. Unlike many people, Hollis was uninterested in what was good for ensuring the annual appropriation, and had solid notions of what was and was not reasonable in the course of a project. Hollis had been Weir's savior when everything went to hell in a handbasket. Weir stopped in the center of the office. The USAC seal on the wall glittered with the light from the desk. Lyle passed by Weir and went to stand before the video wall, her hands clasped behind her back, unsmiling, unmoving. Hollis leaned forward, watching Weir with the air of a concerned uncle, 
It had been a while since they had seen each other, Weir realized. Hollis's hair had thinned, and he could see deeper lines in the Admiral's face. Hollis steepled his hands and tried a small smile. How are you, Bill? Hollis's voice was gentle and kind. Automatically, Weir said, I'm fine. His voice sounded flat, lost in the huge office. There was a long, uncomfortable pause. Hollis waited, watching Weir, who had nothing more to say and no will or desire to invent small talk to keep his favorite brass hat entertained. Hollis glanced over at Lyle. Weir noted that the adjutant barely flinched. It was obvious that Lyle could give the admiral no clues as to the next step. Hollis looked back at Weir, sighed, and sat back in his chair, idly playing with the pencil. Weir felt a pang of sympathy for the admiral. There were no easy decisions, no simple approaches to anything. Even so, he wished this meeting was over. Hollis glanced over at Lyle again, then turned back to Weir. All business now, leaning forward and dropping the pencil on the desk, Hollis said. I apologize for the short notice, but we've had something come up that requires your immediate attention. The Admiral nodded sharply at his assistant. Lyle? This is it, Weir thought. Lyle produced a remote, apparently from up her sleeve, gesturing with it. The video wall lit, bathing the office in a faded blue glow that quickly coalesced. The solar system faded up, turned, closed in. Lyle aimed and fired, and the view tilted and accelerated, closing in on the eighth planet. Virtual boundaries surrounded the chosen area, forcing it to grow in size, magnified until the occupants of the office seemed dwarfed. In the heart of the video wall, confined within a box filled with stars, Neptune shone blue and cold, methane winds rearranging the patterns of its cloudy surface. A red dot was blinking in close orbit around the planet. Stepping away from the video wall and looking intently at Weir, Lyle picked up the thread. At 0300 this morning, TDRS picked up an automated navigation beacon broadcasting at two-minute intervals in Neptune's orbit. Passing by Hollis's desk, Lyle picked up a sheaf of papers, rifling through them quickly, selecting a small stack to hand to Weir, who went through them hurriedly, going back to confirm the data that he had been handed. Incredible. Weir muttered. He looked up from the papers at Lyle, at the video wall, back at the papers, at Hollis. His chest felt hollow, but his heart felt huge and leathery, pounding helplessly in his chest. These are the same coordinates as before the ship disappeared. This... this happened? He swallowed hard, trying to force control, trying to grab hold of the scientific approach before his growing excitement started him shaking. This isn't some kind of hoax? Hollis laid his hand flat on his desk, watching Weir, now with the flinty, hard look that had a dangerous edge to it. Weir turned his head and saw that Lyle had a nervous look about her now. I wouldn't bring you here on a hoax, Hollis said. The Admiral's hand closed into a fist, and he looked down at it as though it had taken on a life of its own and was becoming a threat to national security. Weir recalled too well that strange and unusual events did not go over too well with Hollis. Houston confirmed the telemetry. And ID codes. Weir took several steps toward Hollis's desk, then one back, turning to stare at the video wall. It's the event horizon. Weir said, trying to get his breath, trying to force his heart to slow down. She's come back. Hollis heaved a tremendous sigh, squeezing his eyes shut for a moment, then opening them to see and stare at Weir. That ship was lost in deep space seven years ago. If the Titanic sailed into New York Harbor, I'd find it more plausible. Hollis paused, waiting to see if Weir had anything to say. The scientist settled for running his fingers through his hair, trying to smooth it into place. Houston wants aerospace to send out a search and rescue team, investigate the source of the transmission. If it really is the event horizon, they'll attempt to salvage. 
There was another pause then. Weir turned to look at Lyle, who was watching him intently, then at Hollis. What were they expecting him to say, these military people? This was some kind of foolish game they needed to play, run by arcane rules. As far as he was concerned, Hollis and Lyle could run through their piece, and then they could parlay and get to where they really needed to be. We need you to prepare a detailed briefing on the ship's systems for the salvage crew, Hollis said. There it was. Write a report and go away. That was not the way it was supposed to work. Weir turned fully away from the video wall approaching Hollis's desk. The Admiral set up straighter, giving Weir a hard look. People could, Weir mused, mistake the Admiral's bulk for flap, not realizing that there was a hard man under that uniform. Hollis was a damn good man, but there were no needless soft edges. With respect, Weir said softly, meeting Hollis's eyes. A written briefing can't possibly anticipate the variables on a mission like this. I have to go with them. Lyle took a step towards Weir, who turned his head, wary of the young woman. Lyle had a shocked expression. The sort of look that comes when realizing that another person in the room is a dangerous psychotic rather than a simpleton. Dr. Weir, Lyle said, her voice harsh, you have no experience with salvage procedures. But I know the ship, Weir said, willing the woman to back down now. You can't send a search and rescue team out there alone and expect them to succeed. That would be like... He hesitated, struggling for a smile, running with the first thing that presented itself. He had always been miserable on college debating teams. Like sending an auto mechanic to work on the shuttle. Lyle was face to face with him now, determined to make Weir back down and forget this lunatic idea he had that he would hair off into deep space. I don't see how sending you would improve their chances. Weir had no intention of giving ground. His ship was back. His ship. Lyle could not understand that. I designed that ship. He took a deep breath, staring at Lyle, then at Hollis, and then back at Lyle. I put 14 years of research into this project. I spent the last seven exploring every possible scenario, trying to discover what went wrong. Lyle's eyes narrowed. The adjutant seemed convinced that she had victory close at hand. Your desire to redeem your reputation doesn't factor into this. Weir had been shoving anger into little corners of his soul for so long that he had been convinced that he could not lose his temper any more. Now, fury starting to burn white-hot inside him, he realized that he had made an incorrect assumption. His anger was only waiting for the right reason. This is not about my reputation. He snapped at Lyle, and for good measure he glared at Hollis. This is not about me at all. He turned back to Lyle, bawling his fist, planting his feet. Let them think him belligerent, even dangerous. They had to understand. There was too much at stake for everyone. The event horizon. He went on, measuring his words, speaking as though talking to idiots. Was created for one reason. To go faster than light. Without it, we will never reach new stars. We will never colonize new planets. Mankind's evolution will end here. He looked from Lyle to Hollis. Both were watching him, either wrapped or guarded or both. I have to go. Hollis sighed and sat back, shaking his head. It's not that simple. He held up a hand as Weir glared angrily at him and started to speak. Lyle, play the recording for Dr. Weir. Lyle came back to Hollis's desk, reached down to one of the scattered pieces of equipment. She had the look of a woman with a mission. Weir feared that the mission might well be able to make certain that the salvage team traveled unencumbered. Navigation control tried to hail the vessel, Lyle said. She stabbed at a button and looked up at Weir, nodding toward a chair. Weir sat down. This... This was the only response. 
Waves of sound poured from the office speakers. At first, Weir mistook it for amplified white noise, but then he became aware, aware of other things pushing out from the torrents of static. Noises that caused him to recoil in his chair, sound so primal that he had to struggle not to react instinctively. Screeching, chattering voices, barely heard, that chilled him to the bone and sent the hair on his arms and the back of his neck prickling up. He found himself gripping the sides of the chair, his hands locked. The terrible mixture of sound suddenly broke, plunging back to nothing more than static. Weir sank back into his chair, limp, shaken by the sounds he had heard. Something in those voices had somehow reached into him, touching the cold parts of his very soul. He shivered, remembering seeing himself floating eyeless on the bridge of the event horizon. Lyle shut off the recording. The office was almost silent, only the background noises of Daylight Station being heard. The quiet lasted for a while none of them daring to speak immediately. Finally, Lyle politely cleared her throat. She looked pale and drawn now, her mask slipping. <coughs> Since the initial transmission, there's, there's been no further contact, just the beacon every two minutes. They were doubtless glad for that, too, Weir thought. They had heard more than enough with this one transmission. He sat up, focusing. The crew, could they still be alive? Hollis leaned forward closer to his desk lamp. The Admiral did not look well. Someone sent that message. Admiral. Weir said, mustering all his strength, all his conviction. You have to put me on that ship. Hollis regarded him steadily, the hunter assessing the prey. I must look like death warmed over. Weir smiled slightly at the bitter humor of the thoughts. Lyle had drifted back into one of the darker corners, deliberately absenting herself from this exchange, avoiding any responsibility for events beyond this moment. Lyle was afraid, he realized, though she might not be able or willing to put that fear into words. Hollis was afraid as well, but unwilling to be swayed by that fear. Hollis pressed his right fist hard down onto his desk, looking down at it as he did so. It's against my better judgment, he said and looked up at Weir. But I'll run this by the man downstairs. You'll know my decision by the end of the day. Bullshit, Weir thought, knowing that Hollis had already made the decision and would not need to travel further up the USAC food chain. He managed a slight smile, but his mind was already on the event's horizon, on her return what they might find when the salvage ship got out to Neptune. There would be important answers out there. Thank you, Jack. Weir said softly, rising out of his chair. Don't thank me, Hollis said, looking uncomfortable. I'm not doing you any favors. Weir nodded, uncertain as to whether he should attempt a parting shot of his own. Deciding against it, he simply turned and nodding to Lyle as she lurked in the shadows, left, emerging into the too bright bustle of command. His creation had returned. Everything would soon be well again. Chapter 3 Hollis watched the door close behind Weir. Then the strength went out of him for a moment, and he slumped in his padded chair. Allowing Weir to go on the mission had not been his preference. Considering the shape Weir was in and how he felt about the loss of the event horizon in the first place. That's the trouble with women, Hollis thought sourly. Glancing down at the pell patch on his left ring finger. Men will go right up to the gates of hell for him, no questions asked. Twenty-two years getting one finger indented. A couple of years did little to erase the mark. He felt for Weir. Marks upon the soul could never be erased. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Lyle sliding forward out of the shadows. Out of the adjutants he had had, Lyle was the smoothest, 
a slick character who had the marbles of a press agent and the shootspa of a berserker. It was a rare treat to see her unnerved. Softly, Lyle said, You're not seriously considering sending... We're... Hollis turned his chair so that he could look directly into his aide's eyes, a tactic that made the woman flinch. It was a good idea to keep the young Turks on their toes. You don't just dismiss Bill Weir, he said. His gruff tone meant to indicate that the listener should expect a miniature lecture. Here beginneth the lesson, O oh daughter. The man held Oppenheimer's chair at Princeton. Hollis paused briefly, wondering whether he should ask if Lyle even knew who J. Robert Oppenheimer was, if she knew the correspondence to Weir's life. What the hell? It sounds impressive enough. If the event horizon had worked, Hollis went on, while Lyle stood patiently, her head cocked to one side like a faithful dog, he would have gone down in history as the greatest goddamn mind in physics since Einstein. And we have him here, categorizing stellar objects. Listening faithfully or not, Lyle was not to be deterred from her course of objection. The official inquiry blamed Weir's design for the ship's loss. <laughs> Hollis slammed a hand down on the desk, making Lyle jump. That doesn't mean a damn thing, Hollis reined his temper in, calming himself. Never a good idea to blow a fuse in front of junior staff. He continued in a more reasonable tone. They wanted a scapegoat, and Weir's an easy target. He's not responsible for what happened. Does he know that? Hollis raised his eyebrows, surprised at the tone of concern in Lyle's voice. What's on your mind? He doesn't belong on this mission, Lyle said firmly. She did not flinch away from Hollis's unwavering stare. Hollis had to give her credit for her willingness to take a flag officer on in an argument. Responsible or not, he blames himself. He's too close to it, sir. Lyle paused and Hollis waited. His aide had yet to conclude the argument. Hollis was not about to make it easier for the adjutant. Better for everyone if Lyle got everything shaken out now. Hollis inclined his head. Lyle licked her lips and swallowed. And then, there's his wife. There it was. God knows we've all wondered about Bill's mental state, he thought. It's been two years since she passed. Some things you don't get over, Lyle said, her tone flat. Hollis glanced involuntarily at his ring finger. He had to concede that point, if only because some people were unlikely to get over certain kinds of emotional trauma. He had seen William Weir on his knees while the gates of hell swung open before him. Perhaps this was Weir's chance for redemption. The man could use some serious recovery. Bill Weir is the best chance we have at recovering the ship, Hollis said, and this time his tone brooked no further argument from Lyle. He's going. I want our best people on this. Lyle nodded, moving smoothly back to business at hand. The tension slopping away like water off a duck's back. The Lewis and Clark just returned from patrol in the asteroid belt. She's docked in Bay 4. Hollis hated to do this to a hard-worked crew that was due for some downtime in R&R, &R, but he had no choice. If Lyle was pointing to the Lewis and Clark rather than an overhauled ship with arrested crew, then there was no other ship within reasonable distance of Daylight Station. The Lewis and Clark had a crack USAC crew, one that was used to the pressure and knew how to take orders. They would deal with it. Hollis could trust their captain to keep them in line. Tell Miller to round up his crew, he told Lyle. They're going back out.
Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapters 2 and 3 of Event Horizon, the novelization by Stephen E. MacDonald. Sorry for the delay since the last narration of this book, but I am back on it. This is going to be a once-a-week uh, narration that will be a 48-hour early access upload uh, for Patreon each week uh, before the narration goes live on YouTube. Uh, if you're hearing this on YouTube and would like to have the, the weekly 48-hour early access to the Event Horizon narrations, you can sign up on the Patreon page, link in the description below. For as low as $2 per month, you'll be supporting the channel, and uh, at, that, at the $2 tier, you'll get the early access narrations and also a bi-weekly uh, podcast that is exclusive uh, to Patreon called uh, After the Slash. Um, there's also other tiers that come with more rewards. Uh, $5 tier gets you a free ebook uh, every three months uh, with the early access narrations, the uh, exclusive podcast. You'll also get a free gift every 12 months uh, that you're at the $5 tier. And then the $10 tier and the $15 tier uh, get all those things. Plus, you can voice a character in an audiobook each month, and you get a free gift every nine months and six months, respectively. And uh, there's also a producer tier at $50 a month, and it comes with a lot of great stuff. You can check it out on the Patreon page. Um, I don't make any money off this channel on YouTube. All the ad revenue goes to the copyright holders of the, the contents within the books that I read, uh, the music I use, etc. Uh, but I want to make these books the most exciting and entertaining I can. Uh, and to do that, I do need the support on Patreon and the merch store. So uh, if, you, if you enjoy what I'm doing and you want to see me keep doing it, please sign up on the Patreon. Uh, I really appreciate it. It's what keeps the channel alive. Um, sorry for the delay since the last narration I did of this. Uh, this is going to be, like I said earlier, a weekly narration. You'll get at least one to two chapters of this book every week, uh, early uh, 48 hours uh, on Patreon before it hits YouTube. Um, when I started this book, Right after I put out the first upload of it, uh, I got some medical news uh, about a health problem I'd been dealing with and found out that it was getting worse, not better. And uh, between that and some bad weather we've had this winter, things have just slowed up a lot for me on the channel. Uh, but things are starting to get back to normal. I'm still fighting this health problem uh, the best I can, and I'm going to keep keep going as, as long as I can and fight it as much as I can. I'm, I'm doing okay right now, uh, but I'm, I'm excited to get back into this book, and I hope you are too. I'll see you next week with more of it. Uh, you know, we're still in the early phases of the story here, just setting things up. Uh, but big shout out to Liam uh, Anderson, one of our patrons. He's voicing uh, the main character, Dr. Weir. Uh, doing a great job, man. Uh, Alright, I will see you all next week with another Early access narration of Event Horizon. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying thanks for listening. Be excellent to each other. To all my patrons, thank you so much for keeping this channel alive. To all my YouTube listeners, thank you so much uh, for, for letting me into your lives. And I hope you're enjoying the content that I put out. And I'd love to see you sign up on Patreon uh, and become part of the uh, Patreon family. Alright, see you next time.